Now, everyone, please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to your host, Gerard Merritt. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We'd like to thank those who are here live on campus, as well as those who are watching us online. I am Gerard Merritt, course director in the game, in, uh, for Game Production Tools in the Game Design Master's Program, and I have the pleasure of introducing the speaker for today, Mr. Eric, excuse me, Albert Perez <laughs> from uh, Doghead Simulations. He's the CTO, founder, as well as an Hall of Fame 8 inductee. So I want you guys to give him a round of applause. Those online, I want you to clap too. And let's welcome Mr. Albert Perez. I'll sit in the podium, or stand. So how are you guys doing? Good? Good? Good. You guys ready to learn about mobile games? Yes. And how to ship it? Because, yes. you know, I might have shipped a few in my lifetime. Anyway, so let's to begin. I don't have slides, so we'll just be more interactive. So how is it gonna, ha uh, gonna flow is I'm gonna talk about my career a little bit and how I went through the mobile games and what I did. Uh, it's gonna be all vocal. But I wanted to do most of this as an interactive Q&A. So I want you guys to ask a lot of questions, you know, ask about mobile, mobile VR. But let's stay on topic. You know, it has to be related to mobile. Uh, and we'll go from there. So um, to begin, so I'm Albert Perez. Uh, I graduated in 2005 from game development, uh, game design and development. Um, back then, there was only one degree for game uh, games. Right? You only have game development. Now we have a lot. Um, which is awesome because then you can specialize you know, for real in what you want to work on. But back then, um, it's pretty fun because I get to learn about design, I get to learn about development and all that stuff. And because of that, I was more of a well-rounded person, which kind of helped me in my mobile career, which I'll be talking about pretty soon. So you know, what happened when I graduated out of Full Sail, right? So I started looking for work eight months before graduation. Uh, which is, it should be standard. If you're close to graduation, you should be looking for work, you know, close to graduate, or even when you start um, full sale, you should be looking for work already, trying to figure out where you want to work. Because it's, it's, it, it can be a long process, it's a very scary process, and you want to have enough lead time to do that. So luckily for me, I was able to find work uh, in Seattle at Microsoft. I was, a, I was able to find contract work uh, for Windows Vista. Not games, but it was Windows Vista. So the story was, you know, I got the interview a week before graduation, flew to uh, Seattle, got the job offer, got my apartment, went back, flew straight to graduation, shook Gary Jones' hands, and okay, I'm off back to Seattle. Literally, within the, that weekend, I was back in Seattle doing work. And that wasn't really possible if I didn't do the legwork. So, you know, a little bit of tangent, but it is important that you prepare yourself for that kind of work. Um, so moving along, you know, I worked at Microsoft for a year. You know, that was contract, so there's a limit to that. Um, so you go from there. I went to work for healthcare for three months, which was <laughs> not very fun because it's healthcare, um, being game developer. But you know, and the reason I went to these kind of degrees was when I went through full sale. I was very happy with what I did. You know, I shipped the game. We, we actually sold our game back then in 2005, which was kind of crazy because there was no app stores back there. There's only like a handful, literally a handful of app stores that you could distribute through. And you know, so I was very satisfied. And that's why I was going through these little um, corporate type jobs. And from there, um, the itch started coming back because like, you know, you can only be so far away from your passion. So I started kind of moseying back the games, big fish games. Not quite working on games, but the e-commerce side. And I learned a lot, and that was very, very valuable. And the reason why I'm telling this, because all the experiences I've, I'm learning was being, is gonna be applied to the mobile game part. So after that, um, this little thing called XNA came out. Um, it was a, a framework before Unity came out, uh, before Unreal Engine was more democratized that allowed you to make games easier because you don't have to worry about framework. So if you're a game developer here, um, back in the day, in order to get something on the screen, you had to write so much code. But with XNA, they tried to fix that. You know, they used C Sharp, make it easier. Uh, and thanks to that, 
it became something that you know you should be. There was little excuse to actually not work on a game if you wanted to work on a game. All right, so fast forward, XNA. I did a few titles on Xbox Live Indie games uh, for Xbox 360. I don't know if you guys ever played uh, with the Xbox Live Indie games, but you know, I did two titles there. And because of that, uh, it's a long link with Rinded Story, but it will, I'll get to the mobile games part soon. But um, you know, because of that work I did, I was able to work back at Microsoft to ship uh, these code samples for when the, uh, for XNA. So I work with you know um, I work and ship 43 different items for Microsoft. And you know at the end of that thing, uh, that time that contract, I was like, you know what, you know I know XNA so much. And during that time, Windows Phone was you know was being launched. And I was like, you know I learned XNA. Windows Phone is coming out. There's only a handful, of, literally a handful of us who knew how to ship games on Windows Phone. So I'm like, this is perfect opportunity. Because I missed the Android uh, boat uh, bandwagon, the Apple bandwagon, and I kind of like regretted that. But you know, here was an opportunity to actually get on Windows Phone. So I like do it. So I did it, and I found success because it was a market that no one wanted. To, no one knew how to ship games for. Uh, There's enough people playing there. So I just, I literally ship a game every two to four weeks. Two to four weeks. I did this for a whole year. I ended up with 24 titles for Windows Phone, and I even ported some of them to Android and iOS. And the thing was, about that was, you know, I had thir like 24 titles. That's a lot of titles on a platform. And even though only three of them really were my cash cows, and we will talk about cash cows later, that made me very happy because I, w I literally could just go like, I'm gonna work on a puzzle game. I'm gonna work on a Minecraft clone. I'm gonna work on a driving game. And I could just do it in four weeks. And it's something you finish and you, you feel like, ah, oh, I've done something. Okay, put this in my portfolio, put it in my website. So I even made a website, right? So right now, you know, you guys are being taught that you have to own your brand. So back then, you know, we were kind of taught at the end of school how to do your brand, but it wasn't very in-depth and in how in-depth you guys have it now. So I made my website, I posted everything I have there and all, all the work I've done. And you know, that culmination of work has really, you know, helped me out in my career, even up to now, like, you know, where I got work for the HTC Vive and actually being an employee at Microsoft for two years, they hired me because of all this work I've done for mobile games. All right. So let's talk about how to ship, you know, mobile game on uh, right now. Right now, it's, it's, um, it's a tough market, right? It's so many games out there. There's so much um, competition. But there is big acceptance of it, right? People play games on their phone all the time. So if you, you know, recently, uh, who, who here plays Fire Emblem Heroes? Yeah, see a lot of you guys play it. Pokemon Go, yeah, obviously, yes. Um, Star Wars Heroes, all these games, right? And there's a reason why games are made on the phone because they're accessible to people. Um, people always have five minutes of their time to spare, or you know, it's 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 a computer that's literally always next to you. It's it's part of you now. You're, we're like cyborgs, right? You know, we have mobile phones here. Um, so, with that in mind, like, so how do I actually make a game that's successful. Well, you need to define what success is, right? I mean, now, these days, it's kind of sad, right? But in order to get to the top 100, either you have to be super lucky, super talented with some weird niche thing on your game, or have a, ton, a boatload of money because you're a big company. You're spending you know, $1 million in buying ads or you know, having people force install your game. So how do you do it? What I'm going to tell you guys, because you, know, you guys are fresh off, or you're going to be graduating soon, or graduated ready, is to actually make the game you want to do. Make the game that makes you happy. And make a game that you'll be proud of to show people. Because you know, when you go on an interview, you know, they're going to ask you, so what games have you worked on? Well, let me pull out my phone and show you. And really, that's how you get, you know, get your job. You know by showing off your game on your phone, because this is powerful gesture when you're doing an interview. Well, let me show you what I'm working on. 
because it shows that you can actually get a game you know, published and you say, oh, it's in the App Store and you can say, oh, it's been downloaded 50,000 times, even though 50,000 times might be a small number in the overall sense. But when you say 50,000, the, the guy interviewing or girl interviewing you will be like, oh, someone actually played this game or there's enough quality in it that you, know, you should, I should be listening to this person because they know what they're doing. Um, so there's that. Um, and from what I learned in shipping those 30 games is like, you know, I never regretted a single one that I shipped because I, I, I did it out of passion. I did it out of love, you know, and that's why we're here, right? This is a school of passion and love. We're doing our careers here. Um, and if you continue that, you know, past the school, then you'll be more successful in life. So with that being said, uh, I can't really say exactly like, what the formula of success for a shipping or a mobile game, right? But, you know, if you persevere, if you put your love into it, and, you know, really make sure that you finish these games so that when you go in the interview, you go like, I'm proud of this game. It really exudes that, you know, this, this guy is someone, or this girl is someone we want to hire. Because without that confidence, you're like, you know, you're unhirable at that point because, you know, you can have all the skills in the world, but without the, um, the attitude, the charisma, they're gonna pass over you because you know, there's a lot of people with skills, but you know, when you mix the skills and the personality together, that's what we look for when we hire. All right, so I've rambled long enough. I wanna open it up to you guys because you know, this panel is for you guys and I wanna help you guys out. You know, just you know, run around with the mics, put your hand up and we'll, we'll have a discussion. Uh, do we have the mic? Uh, there you go. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Albert. Um, so you were talking about the importance, or at least the convenience, of having you know your game on your phone to be able to show people. Um, with advent of like VR and like uh, game consoles being really important, um, even possible like streaming technologies, right? Like what uh, PlayStation bought Gaikai, and I know. Right. Uh, Nvidia is working on some stuff. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's going to be that's going to bring the phone market even more important moving forward? Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of if you're showing off something, that's actually quite impressive. I haven't even thought about using Gaikai or the or Nvidia's grid to actually show off a game. But yeah, you could really impress an employer. Look what I did. I put it up the cloud. Now you can play this high fidelity game on the phone. Uh, streaming technology is super important, right? Because more and more. If you look outside of the United States, people, there are more phones uh, per household than there are computers, obviously, because most everyone will have a phone. So you go to Brazil, everyone has a cell phone in their pocket, but they won't have a PC. They won't have a laptop for various reasons, right? It's expensive to have a laptop over there or in Asia. Um, same thing, right? Uh, everyone has a cell phone. Uh, they're all just kind of looking at it. So it's a huge market that you really want to um, capture. Oh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have a question. Did you work on your games only on your own, or you had like friends who helped you? Like, what about artwork? What about sounds? Right. What about like the design? So I'd say for um, probably twenty of my games, I did uh, art, I did coding, I did the marketing, I did the producing. Uh, sound is the one that I always kind of either. I had a sound guy, or I'll use a commercial sound pack um, because you know you can't really do everything. But you know, um, and for the four other projects I had, I actually had friends who were great artists, and I was like, you know, I'll pay you X amount of dollars if you can produce this amount of art for me, and that's how I did it. Um, and you know, like I'll uh, I'll be saying all week is like. You can't produce game. You can produce good games by yourself. But in order for you to produce a great game, you need your friends. You need network. You need people you can trust because, you know, it's not an easy uh, form of art. Because for me, I think games are a form of art, but it requires so much talent, and it is somewhat rare to actually have all that talent in. And even if you did, it's still a lot of work, right? And you're still going to need someone to push you through the hard times and all that stuff. Hello? Hey. Hey. Uh, 
Hey, um, can you run down through the uh, the stages of uh, shipping out your games? Sure. So, I mean, for the short cycle that I have, um, everything starts with a concept, right? You don't start code or you don't start you know, producing art assets without a concept. So, for me, what I did was like, you know, um, I go like, hey, I haven't made a um, Minecraft game. I want to do a Minecraft game or a 2D Minecraft game. Uh, it's actually more like Terraria. Uh, and I said, so, okay, so that's, that's high level concept, what I want to do. And then you go like, all right, so how do we actually make this work within the constraints of the phone? So I go like, okay, I can't have the, I can't have as many blocks as Terraria because those are in PC. I have to have blocks bigger. All right, so how do I do the control scheme? It's very different from a phone than it is on a PC. And then I go, okay, let me concept some art. Let me figure out what technology I want to use. So for that, I had to create a, a world generator. I had to actually use an animation system for the character, um, and then kind of design the what systems do I want, and and really figure out when do I want to ship it, right? Because if you don't put a date on when you want to ship it, you'll never finish it, right? Um, so it's a forcing function for me to put a date there. Um, so from there, and there's going to be a lot of iteration, like with any game development uh, or mobile development, right? You gotta you have a you have a theory, and you have to prove it. And you do that through prototyping and development, iterative development, right? So you keep trying out features, see if you like it, and don't be afraid to throw away, you know, things that don't work. Even though you're super attached and and you really thought it would be the best feature ever, but you wouldn't really know until you you develop it, right? So you do that, and then you you have to constantly test it with your friends or family or whoever you can find, um, because you can't if you keep developing by yourself, not asking for feedback, you'll never know if it's a good game or not, right? And ultimately, we're trying to figure out how to sell a game. And in order to sell a game, you need to get feedback because you know, you're know you not selling it to yourself, right? If you're selling it to yourself, then yeah, perfect. Then I just need to ask myself what game I like. So you need to know your audience. Um, you need to really be um, accepting of feedback, whether it's negative or positive, because ultimately, you're building it for someone else. Um, so after you're done testing, uh, you finalize your artwork, you in insert your sounds, um, and then the hard part comes is marketing. So a lot of people figure, oh, I'll make a game. If it's good, people will play it, people will download it. No, that's not the case. <laughs> um, because people won't find it, right? And it's also the hardest thing to do because it's such a fickle thing to do. Like marketing is like, you could say like, uh, someone spent you know, $5 million on a marketing campaign and he'll go like, I'm pretty sure, I'm not sure if it's half effective or half, you know, what, what caused it to be effective. There's not enough metrics to figure out what makes a successful campaign, uh, ad campaign for marketing. So my suggestion is when you do these marketing, um, when you do your marketing push is, you know, find sites that are, um, uh, that do mobile, like, so all the app store sites that do reviews, send them builds. Um, figure out the strategies for releasing. I remember back in the day for iOS, you kind of want to release in Canada on a Wednesday because this website will pick it up and they'll review it. You kind of want it on a Friday because then no games are reviewed on the weekend, so you stay longer on the front page. I'm not quite sure how the strategy is now uh, for this, you know, currently. Um, you can go to sites like you know Blues News or whatever sites you visit a lot, like say Kotaku or Blues News or whatever. And send them an email. Like, here's a build, here's an APK, or it's available in the store for testing. Uh, try it out. Uh, go to Reddit, put it up there, put it on your social media. Like, you know, Full Sail will always tell you, you have to be branding yourself. You need to be engaging with your social, uh, with social media. And that's what you do. You tell your friends, tell your family, uh, people on Twitter. And that's how you'd market it. Because, you know, obviously, you know, we don't have that big budget that these big companies have. And finally, you release it, right? Um, and when you release it, you have, to, um, you have to make sure you have a strategy how to release it, right? Um, and that big part of that's marketing. And what do you do post-release? Um, do you support uh, patches? Do you do upgrades? Or are you going to work on a port for, you know, if it's mobile, are you going to bring it to tablet? Or are you going to bring it to PC? Or are you bringing it to console? Uh, if you're using a game engine, then th those are pretty easy tasks to do, right? Um, so it, it's a quite a complicated process, that, but once you've done a few of them, it becomes easier and easier 
becomes you, you learn a lot for every uh, mobile game you ship. So, you know, to answer that question is that's th those are the steps. Uh, and I do recommend that you guys like try to ship multiple games. Don't just ship one. Ship one, two, three, four, or five, because you learn so much from each step. And it's something that builds up your portfolio, right? Because we are a portfolio-based uh, industry, right? The more you have under your belt, the better off you are because you've learned from mistakes and you've applied it. And it's important that you actually talk about that too, right? Um, learning from your mistakes and applying it is is the ultimate thing that employers want to hear because you know they expect you to make mistakes. But how do you move forward? How do you solve problems? And that's how you do. It. Next question. Uh, okay, cool. Um, so you said you put out like a lot of games, one every four weeks, right? Yeah. And that uh, some of these games were very successful and other. What was uh, a trait that you found among all your common, um, a common trait among your successful games? Uh, yeah. Mm, it's it's kind of hard because I, I try to apply the same amount of polish to uh, these games. Um, I didn't want to come out with a game that I wasn't proud of, right? But sometimes, a lot of it is luck, right? Um, it might have been you named your game Aardvark, so it's the top of the A-list. You know? um, or you release at the right time, uh, like Flappy Bird, right? Flappy Bird was a very, not very good game in, in terms of when you look at it design-wise and production. But somehow it caught wind through Vine, through social media, and just exploded, right? That guy made so much money. And I'm like, why did I not make that much money? But you know, back then, I didn't have the powerful social media or Vine explosion. Um, more traits. Um, let's see. A lot of them, so there's that. And, and really picking the genre, that, something that survives like high replayability is, is pretty important. Because another thing I, I didn't quite uh, mention is all my games were free. Uh, and you know, I made $150,000 in a year by giving away my games for free, right? And that was through ad revenue. Um, and you know, obviously, back then, the ad revenue was very different from what it is now. But I was able to find a niche of like, I just want to distribute my games for free. And the most important part I did for that was I did not concentrate on the money. The money was just a byproduct, right? That just enabled me to make more games. What I concentrated on was making myself happy in making these games. Because even if I, you know, if I made hundred thousand dollars a year from doing this, I would not continue it if I did not like it. Because I, I could just, you know, do a normal job and make one hundred thirty thousand or one hundred ten thousand, whatever, you know. Um, but there was something about that, the, the games that I made and the money that just came after, you know. Um, and I still would have made those games even if I made $50, $100, because I loved it. Um, so the trait that was, I mean, a lot of them were, um, so I, when I designed my games, I, I designed it, okay, so it's gonna be free. I want, in order for me to, be, to keep making this, I need to make it so that the game design is wrapping around what my monetization strategy is. And that was, you know, the more people play it, the more money I make, because I made more money than views. Um, so that's how the success was. And for some reason, people like my most successful game was Armor Drive. I think it made like fifty thousand uh, dollars. It was just basically a spy hunter clone, but you just destroyed stuff. And people like driving and destroying things, so that's why it was successful. Hey, Albert, uh, we have some questions online for you. Um, one student asks. Uh, this is Anna Perna, by the way, and she asks. She has a two-part question. What do you think is a uh, better or easier platform to ship games on, be it App Store or Google Play? And are there any other platforms to export or ship games aside from those that you recommend? Right. So the cool thing right now is, you know, she's probably using some game engine or, um, and if you're using a game engine like Unity or Unreal Engine, it's so easy to port. There's no reason to pick the Apple Store versus the Google Store versus the BlackBerry Store versus, I mean, there's no Windows Phone Store anymore, unfortunately, um, or console, right? We've, the cool thing about the game development right now is we've democratized uh, how we ship games, right? It's not, 
we're not beholden to publishers anymore. We're not beholden to you know um, people telling us no. We can just ship whatever game we want. Granted, we're doing it with the confines of the restrictions of no nudity, extreme violence, and stuff like that. Um, but another good platform coming up is Steam, right? Steam just announced that they will are getting rid of Greenlight, and they're going to open up the platform for everyone to publish to, which is pretty cool. But we don't know what their gate. They're still going to put some gating mechanism through money, but it's still a worthwhile investment, I'm pretty sure. And you know, Valve is full of smart people that they know what they're doing. Um, but really, like, like seriously, like the more market share you have, the more money you make. But obviously. You do it based off, a lot of it's going to be return on investment, right? Because, because if you're doing Unity, it's multi-platform. To go from one platform to another is very low, um, low effort that you should do it. Otherwise, why would you leave money on the table, right? It's like if someone drop a $100 bill, like, ah, I don't have time to <laughs> pick up the $100 bill, like, oh, bye. You know, unless you're Bill Gates. I think there was something about Bill Gates. Like, it would have cost him more to actually try to pick up the $100 bill because of how much he's worth. But we're not Bill Gates, right? So you never leave the money on the table and walk away if you can. All right, let's go to another online question. This is from uh, Steph. She asks, uh, what, in your opinion, is the best way to get a mobile game out there if you are a new small indie game studio? Make some noise. Um, a lot of... The, the biggest issue, with, or I guess the biggest challenge we, we face as new developers or small time indie, a lot of it isn't really resources. It's really getting attention of people, right? Um, so whatever you can do to grab someone's attention, if you have to make YouTube video, uh, make tutorials, do the conference circuits, you know, have a booth, uh, do your research and how you can grab that audience attention. So if you have to design a game about you know, some uh, current politics, if you want to do that, then if that's your, the game you want to make, and if you make it controversial, that's one way of doing it, right? Or you can just have a good marketing team that can help you. Or just really, that's the biggest challenge, just make sure that people know about you and your game. And it's not just about the game, it's about your company, the people. And the more you can get people to, to, to connect and to feel like they know you, then they're more likely to have fans and just gets bigger and bigger. And it takes time. Uh, user engagement is something that is hard. You know, like you know, for our for my company, Dog Get Simulations, right? We started with zero followers on Twitter. And then we eventually reached 400. And then we went to Brazil two weeks ago and we ran this campaign. If you retweet this tweet and follow us, we will give you a shirt. And we only had like two shirts with us. But we gained 400 followers. We doubled our follower count because we had this little thing that we, you know, people like free stuff. And you give them something substantial enough, they will do a lot of good things for you. So you know, being, being that kind of, not trying to be like a square and like, oh, if you just follow these guidelines, we'll be fine. You really have to look outside the box to, to be successful. And more questions? All right, we got one, no, we got one more. Uh, Alejandro asks, have you tried mass diffusion sites such as Thunderclap, and do you find them effective for free marketing purposes? I've never actually tried uh, these mass diffusion sites, but I mean, there's going to be a lot of people who will say, hey, this is the best way to do it, this is the best way to do it, this is the best way to do it. Do your research, right? There's many ways to distribute your app or have people know about your app. But do the due diligence. It requires, here's the one thing that a lot of people don't realize. Like, no, development effort is here. Marketing effort is just as much. If you don't put the same amount of effort in marketing, you're not going to be successful. And uh, I know it sucks um, because you'd rather develop. But if you can find people who you can synergize with, especially here in school, right? We have you know, so many degrees here and people with different skill sets. If you can find the right people to help you market, then you'll have a higher success, a higher chance of success. All right, guys, from there. Hi. Um, what What do you think is the greatest challenge from concept to uh, actually shipping a profitable game? Uh, the greatest challenge is going through the kind of awkward stage of prototyping and trying to prove that hey, this is something that people will enjoy. So prove, like for something like a bit bigger 
that has you know that requires a little bit more money to get up and running to a prototype, you have to prove to your investors or your stakeholders that hey, this game is fun. This is something we should you know continue doing, and that. And the crazy thing about that is like, you know, if say you're accepting a huge amount of money or some amount of money, it could be from your aunt, dad, or mom, is you kind of somewhat second guess yourself, right? You go like, am I doing the right thing? Am I going to be wasting this person's money? I don't want to do that. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to waste their money and their time. So a lot of it's having to just believe in what you're doing. But don't just believe blindly, right? You have to believe based on data, analysis, research. Um, but it, it still takes a lot of guts to, to to take a game from concept into production, and you know, and, and that's not just the only thing that's challenging. There's you know things all along the way in, in normal development, and really, like they say, right, in in, in game development, you get to 80% so fast, and then the last 20% just takes as much as that 80%, right? Because you have to do all the polish, all the bug fixing, and it kind of gets into the drudgery work, so you're not as excited, kind of, in, in what you're doing. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> uh, my name is Shane, I'm in the game design program. Um, and I know you said that you ship like most of your mobile games just for free and with ads. Mm -hmm. um, I was just curious like how, I mean I know that was like the, the decision you just made, but if you were in a different position and you had to like figure out a different type of monetization strategy, um, how like early in the design process like would you need to incorporate a, like a, some sort of monetization strategy because obviously you don't want to like think about it right away because then that's just you wouldn't you know create as fun a game but um i'd say you should be thinking from the very beginning i mean monetization is super important because without the money there's no more new games and you just end the project there right um but like you said right you don't want monetization to drive the game design as long as you're cognizant of that, then you should be fine, right? There's a lot of games out there that have that are free and have great monetization, and you never feel like you're um, paying so much money for it. You know, like, like right now, I'm enjoying Fire Emblem Heroes, and you know, I have the same deep strategy as the DS games, and I don't feel like I'm being forced to pay money, and that's why I keep playing. It. But you know, there's other uh, design games that really uh, was it Dungeon Keeper Mobile was really bad. I think Sim City was pretty bad. That it drove players away, and no one, you know, it got shut down so quick. So you really need to balance that, you know, gameplay first, mon before uh, gameplay before monetization. But like I said, monetization is a big chunk of it that you still need to consider from the very beginning. Hello. Um, it's sort of like a two-part question. So the first one is uh, uh, some of the mistakes you uh, made mm -hmm. um, on uh, shipping mobile games, and the other one is uh, the the big don'ts that you don't do. <laughs> okay, um, mistakes. I I could say like some of the mistakes was like I didn't try hard enough on some of the games. I, I I was I got lazy or I, I was like ah oh, this other game is very successful I don't want to work on this game as much you know sometimes that's why there's like a two week to a four week game right some of the games are just ah two weeks I'm done I wish I kind of put more effort in that or uh, or did my market research and like you know there's like ten thousand other games like that why are you making that but you know at that point I didn't really care I, was like, I just want to make a, a puzzle game because I've never made one. Um, but you know, for me, I, I don't like to, to, to dwell too much on the mistakes. I've you know, I make them, I, I learn from them, and I move on. And I, I don't really want to remember the mistakes too much. Just the learnings, right? Um, and for the second question, um, the don'ts. Don't uh, don't put out a game that's not ready to be viewed. Um, if it's super prototypey. Maybe it's fine because it's so prototypey that no one cares. But if you have a game that's kind of half baked, you have to be very careful, right? Because brand awareness, and you only have so much uh, exposure you can give people, especially if you're posting on Facebook, right? Uh, if you put too much of your games, like, oh, every day or every 30 minutes, or here's a new video, here's a new screenshot, and your friends will hate you. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, the, another don't is not having a plan. You always should start with a plan. But don't be so rigid that you can't deviate or you can't you know, pivot when you see something new come out of the plan. But you always have to start with a concept. Otherwise, you'll be directionless. You don't want to do that. And, and really, what another thing in, in our life is the most limited resource we have is time, right? I mean, we can, have, we can be all be millionaires, billionaires, but we all walk along the same time, right? So value your time by not wasting it. Uh, and one last thing for a don't is um, don't disparage other games um, because, you know, it's, a, it's someone's work of love. Even if it's the, the, the shittiest game ever, uh, something you don't like, you know, don't don't hate on the developers. Like support them, right? We're a small community, and we're here to support each other. And you know, the other game developers are the most supportive people you ever meet. I've met so many pe other game developers that just want to cheer you on, and you cheer them on too. And you know, that's what you should be doing. Um. Um. Hey. Um. Earlier, you said that um, having uh, multiple mobile games would look good on a portfolio and such. So I was wondering, is it, like, in that aspect, is it more important to have, like, multiple good games as opposed to, like, one great game? And um, also, uh, kind of with that, you said you spent, like, two to four weeks on your games. I was wondering, like, what's the, like, minimum amount of time you should spend in a game before you, like, even think about shipping it? So to answer the, your, your last question first, um, you work on a game until it's done, right? You don't want to release a game that's half done or half assed that your employer, you, you release a game when you're proud of it, right? You release a game so that when you go show someone, hey, this, I made this game, check it out, right? And we're not go like, I hope he doesn't see this or I hope it doesn't crash. Um, but you also, you kind of balance it out to, right? you can't always work on a game for, you know, 50 years or something, right? I mean, some dude did it for 10 years, but, you know, you got to put a, a, a set date so you can move on. Because the point of making a lot of games uh, and finishing it is proving to your future employers or to yourself that you can actually finish projects. Because you could say, you know, for me, how I sell myself when I present to my future employer or um, interviewing when I present the games, like, I've made this game, I encountered this problem, I solved it this way, and finished it, shipped it, you know, downloaded this, and I go through each one of them, and they go like, oh wow, this guy knows you know, how to finish projects. Because a lot of times when you're at work, everything's project-based, right? You, oh, we're gonna do this project. Even if it's a small component of a game or, or a website or whatever, there's so little projects that you kind of finish, and you do have to have that, um, that mentality of actually trying to finish it, because you, you need that quality. So what, what was the first question? <laughs> uh, the question was, in terms of portfolio is it better to have... Oh, okay. Okay, I remember now. Uh, so the question was like the portfolio, like many, like one good versus many. I mean, depends, right? I mean, for Chance Glasgow, Call of Duty was all he... I mean, he made a lot of Call of Duties, right? But you know, that one IP, for me, it's like I, I worked on a lot of different IPs, a lot of different work jobs. And they're both valid, uh, and really depends on what you want to do. If you want to do something really great once, or good smaller uh, things. But the the most important part is you're making something of quality, right? Something you'd be proud of, because if you produce, you know, ten pieces of crap, then it's ten pieces of crap. If you produce one piece of crap, it's one piece of crap. But if you produce, you know, one good piece, there's ten good pieces. Good. Sorry, Albert, we got a few more uh, online that we wanted to get to as well. Uh, sure. Anthony asks, are, uh, what opportunities are there for writers in mobile games? There's a lot. I mean, a lot of people think like, you know, with mobile games, it's a five minute experience, right? There's, um, there's this one game I forgot, it's like a, like a text-based game where an astronaut's talking to you and you're trying to save them. Um, same thing, and you know, like I said earlier, when you're doing multi-platform, you're doing a, working with Unity or Unreal or some multi-platform engine, is you're not just stuck with just writing for one platform. It, it surpasses that. So, writing for mobile games is the same as writing for video games, right? If 
you know, if you're making a game for a puzzle, like, you know, puzzle type game, then it might not have as much narrative. But, 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 with writing, so, it, it's funny, because for me, writing is pretty important. Narrative is super important, because everything in a game actually has narrative. Even Puzzle Quest, um, Tic-Tac-Toe, they all have narrative. It could be an internal narrative to the player, or it could be a narrative presented to the player through the game. And this all requires writing. Uh, even with creative writing, um, even it, let's say, you know, you still need to create documents sometimes for games, and that's one avenue of doing it uh, if you're a writer. Um, but yeah, I mean, and don't be afraid. Like, not because just because that no one has really made a lot of writing games for mobile doesn't mean you can't do it. So, you know, and the cool thing about being working on mobile games, it's so easy to produce work, right? There's no excuse for you to not to produce something that you're really passionate about. So if you're very passionate about writing, you know, a, a, like a text adventure on mobile, do it. I mean, there's not a lot, that's not enough of them. It's a niche that you, you should really go for. And when uh, publishing mobile games, do you recommend opening, this question is from Doug, by the way. Uh, do you recommend opening an LLC or <laughs> would you rather publish under your own name? Talk to your lawyer. <laughs> no, but the, the ser in seriousness, um, um, caveat, I'm not a lawyer, uh, this is not legal advice. Um, LLC has great benefits because it, it separates you as an entity and the company. So if your company ever gets sued, they can't pierce through that company to sue you. So if the company has $50, they can sue for $50 and that's it. Or you just close the company, end of story. But if you do it on your own, then you know, they can sue you. Um, but I didn't make an LLC because I didn't want to, I was kind of like, ah, if I do an LLC, you get more paperwork, you have to deal with a bank, a separate SSN, there's more cost to it. Um, publishing under your own name has its risk, but it's also easier uh, tax-wise as well doing that. So um, before you engage in that, you know, ask an accountant or ask a lawyer, um, ask your friends, or someone who can actually give you legal advice for that, because there's pros and cons. Here's another question that we had. Um, from your perspective, how do games get reviewed or censored in the mobile space? And what types of copyrights or trademarks are the most important to get? Um, <clears throat> your IP is probably the most important thing to copyright or register. Um, trying to patent gameplay mechanics is uh, actually impossible. Um, it's not really worthwhile, but if you're creating IP that you think is going to be big, then you should really make sure you protect that. Um, and that's about it. I mean, yeah. Hello. Hey. Um, this question is kind of about the whole 24 games in a year span. Mm -hmm. um, this is a similar concept that I thought of once, and the biggest issue I constantly come back to is the scope problem. Right. When you're building something, scope can get out of hand and get away from you. And like you said, you want to finish, you want to ship a, a polished product. Um, how did that come into play in terms of designing, and especially the rapid design that you went through? Uh, basically, don't be afraid to cut features, cut, 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 cut. Uh, especially, you know, with mobile, right, you have to really focus on the design because if it's too complicated, then your UI gets really muddy. Um, explaining a game to someone that's super complicated on mobile is very tricky, right? We've all played those, you know, tutorials that caught that. Like I'm pressing like 30 buttons to get through this. I just want to play the game. Really bad experience, right? And they made the game too complicated. And you know, when it's complicated, the scope's really exploding up too. So a good benefit of cutting is it makes the game simpler so you can actually hit your targets. And it takes discipline, right? Uh, it's, it's easy to like, say, oh, it's not a new feature. Oh, this will be cool. But you have to really like, pull yourself back and like, hey, does this actually add value to the game? And what kind of value does it add? And what kind of effort do I need to put it in there? Uh, if it doesn't add value, don't put it in. So you can move on. You know, you can always test new concepts down the road. But if you want to do the 24 games in a year, then you just do that. Uh, 
Uh, hello, I'm August Lee from the Game Design Degree. I was wondering what the balance between updating a game and creating a new one, and when to do one or the other. Right. Um, so it, it, a lot of it depends on your game design, right? So if your game is more like a uh, the new type of game now, there's always a backend service running, and you're always pumping in new updates, then you'll be updating every week, could be every day. Um, but how you serve that update um, will save you a lot of time if you have actually a mechanism built into the game so that you can just you don't have to push through the Apple Store or the Google Store because that can, you know, especially Apple Store right, with certification, you need a delivery mechanism to, if, especially if you're just updating content, um, then you just push that. Um, and versus creating a game, I mean, you create a game when you want to create a game. If you feel like you don't want to work on that game anymore, or you feel like, oh, this game kind of failed, it's not going to make more money then just stop working on it and work on a new game because, you know, unless you're trying to salvage it or you have a longer term plan for it. Um, but if you're trying to do that 24 games in a year, then you should kind of, you're more, op more likely to move on than to try to salvage something that's most likely going to die. Um, my name is Noah from the game design degree. Um, my question kind of goes back to monetization. I was wondering, when do you decide to, or what's the thought process between deciding either to monetize a game or just charge full price? Um, depends on the experience you're making, right? I mean, charging full price could be $4, $10, $15, right? It depends on how big of a content you have and what your strategy is. If you just want to do the huge spike of sales and then trail off to nothing, then you know having that um, premium content be charged is good, right? Because you want to charge the people what the true value is of the product, right? And you should always charge. You all should always start with the high price. Well, not always the high price, but the, the correct value. And then you can always discount down. But if you start 99 cents, you can't go up, right? So it's a downward thing. And for the free part. Um, if you really don't care about monetization and you just want to be free, then just give for free so that more people can play it. And then maybe you can realize, oh, wow, this game is actually getting a lot of traction. How do I inject monetization for it to work? Um, but you know, that kind of goes against what, what I said earlier about thinking about monetization early. So <laughs> uh, it all depends on your plan, right? But like I said, plans change. Like you, know, you, you might have planned for it to be completely free, but you've learned, like, oh my god, a million people downloaded this. This is my opportunity to monetize it, and then you do it. You have another question. Um, for, those who, um, for those who are disabled, what sort of opportunities are there in the, in the gaming industry, in the mobile gaming industry in particular? Did you say disabled? Yes. Like, what kind of disabilities? Uh, they didn't disclose. OK. <laughs> um, there's always a lot of opportunity, because you know, accessibility is such a big thing for phones, uh, for computers, right? Because you know we don't realize how many people who have uh, disabilities, right? It could be from color blindness, it could be from dyslexia, or or having you know, issues with your hands. Um, you, if you're designing for mass market, you know you kind of design so that most people can play it. But if you're truly designing a game that's targeted for people with disabilities, then you you go that niche, right? I mean, there's always going to be a niche for that. If you want to do help people with um, like a mobile game, say, oh, here's a good story, actually. So mobile VR, so this one guy had a lazy eye, right? Uh, his eye was going this way. And what he did was like, he researched on how to fix his lazy eye, and he applied it using mobile VR. Well, it was actually VR, but close enough. That he actually created a kind of like a game that would train his right eye to actually uh, retrain the muscles. So he was able to actually fix his lazy eye to look straight again. Uh, using technology, and this is a small example, right? Um, but it's it's a tricky question because you know people with disabilities isn't it's not technically a, a big part of market. And when you look at it in the big picture, you kind of go, well, I should target the big people, uh, the the majority first, and then specialize. But you know, we should always look out for this uh, for people with disabilities. You know, accessibility is a big field that we should always look forward to. But you know, we have realities of business that we can't always target at. But if we see an opportunity, we should always take care of them. Hey. OK, so um, this is 
again, focusing on more of like your development process, but in terms of like, you were developing all those games all the time and then you're also marketing them. At what point did you start marketing them if you had like a turnaround that was so fast and how long did you stay like marketing that single game? Um, it, it became something that I was used to. I had a template and I had the list of people I need to email or contact. So it became like, it would be a marketing one week. So there, there would be like a gap of like a few days. Um, and then you can get a good sense if your game's gonna get traction. Cause like you can see that your chart go up and then down and flat. Then you're like, okay, move on to the next one. Um, so it's a matter of just like anything, right? It's uh, return on investment. Well, what what do I focus on? Because we can only focus on so many things. Hello, I have a question. Uh, if you want to develop a game for iOS, would it be more convenient to work in Xcode? And if you want to develop something for PC uh, market, do you want, uh, you probably should work on Visual Studio? Or it doesn't really matter what platform you develop. Like well, so. it depends, right? If you're building something um, like really graphic intensive for the iPhone or iOS, right? You probably want to develop for more native, like if you're using Metal, Apple's Metal, then you go that. But if you're tar targeting multi-platform and you're not trying to go so crazy with you know, performance, then you can use a game engine. Um, I, I always err on the game engine side because it opens up the market a lot better. Because you know, if you create your own technology from scratch, porting it, the, the amount of work is really high um, unless you're really exclusively locked into one platform. And for, uh, for PC, um, same thing, right? You, you pick, you know, if you want to use Visual Studio, if you want to use Java or C Sharp, C++, or whatever other frameworks. I mean, either way, you're still going to use some kind of framework. So just pick the tools that make sense for your project and what your goal is. Another question from, uh, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Hello again. Um, so I know you said that when you were doing that, you know, the 24 in a year um, uh, cycle, you, that you did, or at least for 20 of them, you did like your own art? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so hypothetically speaking, if I'm terrible at art, <laughs> what would be a good way to kind of, I, I guess, leverage some sort of like minimal art skill into kind of making the game look at least somewhat okay. Right. Um, you can use open source uh, art packs, or if you're in Unity, you can you know use the asset store, uh, or just learn to get better at art. I mean, <laughs> there's there's nothing there's no magic bullet, right? It's like well, you have to give one or another. Um, but it's exciting, right? You're learning a new skill and you're becoming more hireable by learning to be better at art. Um, and another thing I did was, um, th so the games, all these games are actually 2D games. They're not 3D games. That's, you know, because the turnaround would be a lot bigger if I was using 3D models and all that stuff. I would probably just end up working with two games, maybe one, um, if I use 3D. But with 2D, that was a conscious decision because I wanted to crank out a lot of games. So just pick your battles. And it all depends on if you really want to ship that many games in a year, then yeah, you do what you need to do. Another, sorry, we got another one uh, from online. Um, you talked about how your early games that were free had you know, made money for you off of ad revenue and the models are constantly changing. So what do you think is the next step for free games in the App Store and Google Play in terms of how they can, uh, how, how they can make revenue in the next, say, five years or so? <laughs> five years. Um, okay, five months, maybe. <laughs> five, five months may be easier. Uh, I mean, if you look at the market, right, everything is pretty much free. I mean, there's like, you know, uh, Square Enix might charge you $15 for a port, but that's kind of cheating because that's like content from like 20 years ago, 10 years ago. They're, they're porting over. Um, but what really is the most important part is like, regardless of what technique you want to do, because like, it's kind of hard to predict that, because if you could predict that, then I'll, I would not be here. I'll be making game, mobile games right now, trying to be rich, right? I mean, 
But what you really need to do is create value, right? If you create value, then people will want your product. Or if they try it, they see the value, then they'll keep using that product, right? And then you can monetize. Without value to your product, people will be like, oh, that was cool. Okay, I'm done. You know, they'll never keep using it. And you know, the, the typical thing that people want or businesses like is uh, recurring revenue. Like a solid recurring revenue, a subscription plan is what businesses crave because a lot of times you forget that you have a subscription or you forget that you have a recurring revenue and you don't want to change it because, oh, I might play this game in two months and that's fine. And nothing you know, makes businesses happier by saying like, oh, we're going to have you know, steady income month to month and that makes them happy and makes me happy. So. So when you were doing the 24 games um, within a year, was there any point where you're like, hey, maybe I should make a sequel to this one? Were you ever tempted to do if you didn't make a sequel? Maybe on the more successful games? Did I make a sequel? Uh, oh, I did kind of try to make a sequel, but I never said, you know, one of the games was Armor Drive. I didn't say Armor Drive 2. I just said, you know, I just did the same formula, but with a different theme and tried to change it up. And the second one after Armor Drive didn't quite pick up. So I was like, oh, okay, that was fail. Um, but you know, for that 24, you know, the whole reason I did that 24 games for a year, within a year is to actually build as many genres that I wanted to build because I didn't never had the time before or never got an opportunity. And you know, doing sequels doesn't really align with that goal. So do you have any tips for developers on localizing games in other languages where ah. you don't have a lot of resources? And then uh, also, do you have any tips or, uh, I guess, insights on how to break into the uh, Chinese or Asian market since mm. mobile is just huge over there? Right. Um, yeah, it's a big can of worms. Uh, localization, in terms of that, I mean, you could rely on machine translation, but obviously, Effective localization requires uh, native speakers to understand the, the topic, and even for the design part, understanding how that market works. Um, so there is no easy way to say, hey, you can localize for $5, and your game will be a success. Um, it just requires just as much effort. Uh, and in terms of breaking into the Asian market, it's very tough, because uh, in Asia, the market is very different from the US, right? because the carriers control what games go onto their phones, especially in China. China is crazy locked down, and there's so much content coming out there that you know, unless you, underst you fully understand what, uh, what games they play, the language they speak, um, what kind of nuances they like. I mean, a lot of Chinese games are super grindy in the mobile business, and you know, they love that. Uh, it's fine. But is that the type of game you want? You know? Uh, in Japan, they have their own flavor of quirkiness in their games, right? Do you understand the quirky nature of Japan, and can you actually make it appealing to them? And you do have to localize to those. Um, and then there's another problem of uh, certification, right? Uh, Brazil and Korea are like, really hard to get certified for because you actually have to go to the certification process. So if you're a small indie dev, you might actually just skip those. Um, but you know, don't let me stop you from trying to get into, into Asia because you know it is a lot of people there. All right, we got time for one more. Okay, so I actually have two questions. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Well. Uh, one question is, what's your opinion on mobile app uh, crash and market crash? Because there's just so many free apps that every app that basically requires money have about the same app that is being uh, distributed for free. And this kind of creates problems because I know many big mobile game studios who don't really release good games anymore because they don't really like gain that much money. And my second question is, uh, if you want to use game engine for fun, you can use it for free. But if you want to publish something with this game engine, you have to pay royalties. And what's, in your opinion, the best game engine and is like the best uh, terms of loyalties? Right. Ro um, royalties. Uh, let me ask you the second question first. I mean, right now, Unity doesn't ask for royalties. There's a license you pay. Um, you don't have to pay for Pro or Plus. You can be free as long as you let them use that splash screen. Uh, and your engine has you know, X number of users. 
And really, once you hit the, the rate of where you're successful, then you just, you just do your royalties, you do your licensing because you already have the revenue. It's part of cost of doing business. Uh, trying to get everything as free as possible is not the best idea because you know, a lot of times uh, what you, you get what you pay for, right? Um, but in terms of like the bottom, the race to the bottom for free apps, it's just the nature of the beast. You just have to deal with it. Um, it like I said earlier, if you create value, People will download your game, will play it, and um, you just need to rise ab above the whatever crap that they put out there. And it's not that hard either, right? If you put enough effort, you talk to the right people, you, you market it properly, then it's not that hard to rise above that. It's, the problem is the, the rest of the other better games or really good games that you have to fight for is the problem, not the bottom. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody, for attending today. And let's give Elbert a nice round of applause. Thank you, guys. Have a great lunch.